You're listening to WNYC. Up next, Marketplace. On the show tonight in animation, creating 3D landscapes is the most expensive part of production. And if you have one castle here, one city corner, and you want the character to run through it, then you actually have to build the whole thing. But you know what could help animators save time and costs? You guessed it, AI. That's on Marketplace tonight. More All Things Considered at 7. Support for WNYC comes from Starkmont Financial, providing accounting professionals for entertainment and healthcare companies. Additional information at starkmontfinancial.com. WNYC, independent journalism in the public interest. 93.9 FM and AM 820, NPR News and the New York Conversation. Marketplace is supported by JLL, a commercial real estate partner dedicated to creating lasting change for good in business, communities, and the planet. JLL.com. See a brighter way. Two words, gang. Two little words. Bond and yield. From American Public Media, this is Marketplace. Marketplace is supported by C3 AI. C3 Generative AI provides chat GPT enterprise search that is verifiable, secure, and accurate across all enterprise data. C3.AI. This is Enterprise AI. In Los Angeles, I'm Kai Rizdal. It is Monday. Today, the 21st of August. Good as always to have you along, everybody. We begin today... Not far from where we left off last Friday, actually, in the bond market and the interesting, shall we say, behavior of the benchmark U.S. 10-year Treasury bond. 4.35% was the yield on the 10-year today at one point, which, while historically not so bad, is more than a full percentage point higher than it was this past spring. All of that is a long-winded way of saying that money in this economy is getting more expensive. And we have talked a lot about why that is. The Fed raising rates, of course. The prospect of a healthier economy to come as well. Also, though, this, the people, countries, that is, that usually buy American debt are becoming a little less interested among them, China and Japan. Marketplace's Sabri Beneshore gets us going. As foreign countries go, Japan and China are big holders of U.S. debt. Two of the biggest, number one and number two. Josh Lipsky is at the Atlantic Council. In case you're wondering, most of our government debt is held domestically. Only about 30% is held abroad. But about a third of that is held by China and Japan. Comes out to a little more than $2 trillion in U.S. Treasuries. And right now, those two countries look like they are backing off. That doesn't mean they don't have appetite, but it does mean they are diversifying a little bit away from U.S. Treasuries. The reasons reflect things going on in the Chinese and Japanese economies. China's central government is taking more control of the country's finances at a time when the economy is slowing down. Lipsky with the Atlantic Council says Chinese politicians may therefore use more of the government's own money to deal with those troubles at home. To invest more domestically and to help regenerate growth in their own economy, and they believe they can do that through domestic investments, and so they put a little less in U.S. Treasuries. In Japan, the yen is at a decade's low, and some investors think it might rise moving forward as interest rates rise in Japan. If the currency does strengthen, that would eat into the value of investments in treasuries. Brad Setzer is with the Council on Foreign Relations. If you're a Japanese investor and you bought U.S. dollar bonds, the big risk you face is that the yen will go up and the dollar will go down, and the yen value of your dollar bonds will go down. So it wouldn't make much sense for Japanese investors to buy a lot more treasuries. Plus, rates are rising slightly in Japan. It might make more sense to invest at home. Both China and Japan have their own complicated sets of reasons for possibly not wanting to buy as many U.S. treasuries. It's just a little bit less expected demand, which is helping driving up the borrowing costs for the U.S. government. In New York, I'm Sabri Beneshore for Marketplace. On Wall Street today, traders did not seem all that phased by rising rates. Tech was the big winner. We'll have the details when we do the numbers.
On Wall Street this week, there are basically just four letters that matter. N-V-D-A, or if you prefer the full name of the company and not just its ticker symbol, N-V-I-D-I-A, the chip maker, NVIDIA, that's powering a lot, by which we mean most of the AI boom. Its advanced graphics processing units, GPUs they're called, have become must-haves for training generative artificial intelligence models, the ones that power ChatGPT and Stable Diffusion and a whole mess of others. We mention all that because NVIDIA reports earnings on Wednesday, and traders are going to be reading the tea leaves not just for that company, but for the entire industry that runs on its hardware. Marketplace's Megan mccarty Carino's on that one. The last time NVIDIA dropped an earnings report back in May... Investors went kind of bananas, says analyst Daniel Newman, CEO of Futurum Group. The guidance absolutely set the market ablaze. The company predicted growth that was beyond anyone's wildest expectations. Markets read that as a sign that chatbots were more than a fun party trick. This year, NVIDIA shares have soared by about 200 percent, sending the company's total valuation near a trillion dollars. This week, Newman says, we'll see if that momentum sticks. Meaning this isn't a blur. This isn't just a temporary moment. This is game on that AI is going to be supercharging the next wave of technological growth. And the tech sector could probably use some supercharging. Rising interest rates and questions about how long they'll stay high have made markets kind of meh. But an AI gold rush could turn things around, says analyst Matt Bryson at Wedbush Securities. If you remember back in the mid-90s when the internet came about, it was that kind of increase in, in, in productivity that created the economic boom of the mid to late 90s. Oh, yeah. But remember what came next? People would be smart to be wary of bubbles. That's business professor Eric Gordon at the University of Michigan. It turned out that the Internet did change everything, but it didn't change everything as quickly as we thought. Still, signs of a bubble aren't likely to show up in NVIDIA's share price anytime soon, says Chris Miller, author of Chip War, the fight for the world's most critical technology. There's no doubt that demand for NVIDIA's chips is extraordinarily high. The big question is, what's supply look like? NVIDIA's GPUs are made by just one manufacturer, TSMC, in Taiwan, which can't ship them fast enough. So customers are having to wait and pay higher prices. I'm Megan McCarty Carino for Marketplace. One of, and depending on who you ask, maybe the reason Hollywood writers and actors are on strike is because of what artificial intelligence might mean for their art and thus for their jobs. But what exactly might generative AI mean for their art and their jobs? What can it do? One post-production company in China is starting to get an idea. It's been running some tests with AI for a Chinese animation project, and they invited Marketplace's Jennifer Pack in to see the results. Here is her story from the eastern Chinese city of Xiamen. Base Media is a visual effects and animation firm with a Beijing HQ and offices across China, including here in Xiamen. It's worked on Hollywood blockbusters such as Wakanda Forever and big Chinese films like Wandering Earth. The firm's visual effects supervisor is Igor Lodero. I'm from Spain. And... Uh, your two-time Emmy Award winning... No, no, no. I nominated twice. I got one victory. Lodero holds also. one Daytime Emmy Award and has worked on many Oscar-nominated movies. He recently did a test project using generated artificial intelligence for the Chinese streaming platform iQiyi. So, first the client provides a picture. This is a real picture thing. ITE has a mini we studio called that. Wonderworks. Its head is Wang Huiyu. She wanted generative AI to create 3D locations, the most expensive part of animation production. And if you have one castle here, one city corner, and you want the character to run through it, and you want a bird's view of the character to meandering in the alley, then you actually have to build the whole thing. Virtually, that is. Build every storefront and every window. 
So to test the capabilities of AI, she gives Base Media a short script about a girl looking for her friends and an animation series she just finished called The Rufus. It's 260 minutes of the show for the machine to learn. To learn the style and look of the animation she wants. Rufus is gone. Where are you? And the base media team put together a rough cut. They animated the character by hand and put gray blocks in the background and everywhere else. The team inputs some photos and keywords, and the AI produces this final video. The animated character skateboards down a wooden bridge in Beijing, runs across curved Chinese rooftops, and hangs off a gargoyle overlooking the sprawling city of Paris. AI generated every location the character passes through. Some tweaking was done by hand, so the final video took three weeks to complete. It would have taken more than eight with a human animation team. As a viewer, I couldn't tell what was done by AI and what wasn't. That's the best thing we could hear. That's Chris Bremble, the founder of Base Media. I reached him at a busy hotel lobby in the U.S. The audience shouldn't be watching a show and going, "Oh, this is AI generated." As for visual effects supervisor Igor Lodero, he's thinking about what else AI could replace in animation production. He's very excited about AI's potential, but does he worry about his team's job security or his own? Listen,、uh, this is power tools. This is things that let us do more, better. This is a very competitive market. If you now can produce higher quality at the same price, now you have the upper hand. But base media is proceeding with caution because not every client is on board with AI. Again, the firm's CEO Chris Bremble. Our Chinese clients are saying AI, AI, AI. How can you do more? Get us more. Our U.S. clients are literally like, you need to sign an agreement saying you know AI has been used in the creation of your work at all. Because he says in the U.S. there's more concern about copyright infringement. That also worries ICE's Wang Huiyu back in China. But she's more excited about AI's ability to boost her creativity in a very competitive environment. She wants to see what else AI can do, like making food look more realistic in animations. You know, the real food take a lot of detail to make the texture, the steam, and the transparency. I haven't tested with nature, like flower leaves and dew. After a few more trials, she says she wants to do a whole movie using generative AI. In Xiamen City, I'm Jennifer Pack for Marketplace. This is one of those audio stories where the visual really will help you out. Have a look at what the ad animation Jennifer was talking about actually looks like. It's on our Instagram Marketplace APM is the handle. Coming up, we we're like, okay, we're gonna tattoo ourselves. Can you help us <laughs> today? I don't know about that. First, though, let's do the numbers. Dow Industrials off 36 points today. That's about a tenth percent. Ended at 34,463. Did the blue chips? The Nasdaq gained 206 points, one and a half percent. Closed at 13,497. The S&P 500 up 37 tenths percent, 43 niner niner there. Tesla. Revved up seven and three tenths percent today after cutting prices on some of its models in China. Electric truck maker Nikola tumbled almost 23 percent and announced a recall of 209 electric trucks after an independent investigation of a fire back in June. Rivian accelerated one and nine tenths percent today. Movie chain AMC dropped almost 24 percent on Friday. A judge approved the company's plan to convert its preferred shares to common stock. Rival Cinemark Holdings gave back one and three quarters percent. Shares of Hawaiian Electric. Dropped more than five percent today, as Wells Fargo lowered its price target rather, and maintained an underweight rating on that stock, citing Hawaii's wildfires as an ongoing risk. Bond prices fell. The yield goes up when that happens. Ten-year T-note four point three four percent at the close. You're listening to Marketplace. Marketplace is supported by Odoo, provider of an all-in-one management platform with a suite of fully integrated applications designed to simplify and connect every aspect of business in one software. More at odoo.com. 
and by the Peter G. Peterson Foundation, a nonpartisan organization dedicated to raising awareness and accelerating action on America's fiscal challenges to build a brighter economic future for the next generation. Learn more at pgpf.org. WNYC is supported by NJPAC Productions, presenting an intimate conversation and Q&A with ethologist and activist Jane Goodall at King's Theater in Brooklyn on Saturday, September 30th. Tickets on sale now at kingstheater.com. After a three-year-plus pause, student loan payments are about to resume. On the next All of It, we'll talk with a student loan expert about what to do before the pause ends and how to plan for repayment. And we'll take your calls and questions. Plus, we'll talk about the new series Command Z from writer Kurt Anderson and director Steven Soderbergh. Join us for All of It, weekdays at noon on WNYC. You're listening to Marketplace on WNYC. Coming your way in the 7 o'clock hour of all things considered, Southern California has spent days in anxiety waiting for Tropical Storm Hillary. We're going to hear about the expectation versus the reality in the 7 o'clock hour. Stay with us. This is Marketplace. I'm Kai Rizdahl. This will come as no surprise to those who've been in the market for a car the past few years, nor to anyone even tangentially familiar with economic news. but. Cars are just expensive now. $20,000 used to be, give or take, a starting point. Now, there's exactly one model on the market that sells for something near that, the Mitsubishi Mirage. And then once they get them, between inflation and high interest rates, consumers are having a harder time paying for their cars. Car loan delinquencies are back up to where they were in the Great Recession. Marketplace of Kristen Schwab takes things from there. When the lease on Serena Pacino's Honda Civic ended, she decided not to buy the car. Looking back on that now, it's a mistake. I should have definitely <laughs> kept the car that I had. Pacino, who lives outside New York City, has been sharing a car with her husband for eight months now because shopping for a new one has been difficult. She's hoping to spend no more than $30,000. And the shocking thing for me is the, the value that doesn't seem to be there at that price point. On top of that, it's been hard to find the kind of car Pacino wants, a sedan. They are not on the lot because they're selling so fast. More consumers and car makers are focused on bigger, more expensive cars. And with the pandemic chip shortage, the average price of a vehicle has ballooned to $50,000. That's 10K more than it was five years ago, according to Gartner analyst Mike Ramsey. Plus, he says high interest rates mean car payments for the average vehicle have gone up more than $100 a month. That starts to make a, a pretty substantial difference in people's ability to afford the vehicles. He thinks the market has finally reached its price limit. Sales are slowing. Inventory is up. Companies are starting to put less emphasis on higher end models. Ramsey says deals could get sweeter with incentives. Rebates and subsidized financing, and that lowers the price a little bit. He thinks sticker prices could come down, but they're unlikely to fall back to where they were pre-pandemic. Meanwhile, used car prices are not looking much better. That's because demand is still high and supply is low. Fewer new cars were sold over the last couple years, so there are fewer used cars on the market. David Whiston is an analyst at Morningstar. There's no used car factory, right? That used car does not exist, and that's going to take several more years to work its way through. According to the auto research site Edmunds, the average sale price of a used car is now just over $29,000. I'm Kristen Schwab for Marketplace. It seems pretty clear that work from home is here to stay in some form or another for those who can. The American Time Use Survey that was out earlier this summer from the Labor Department, it's a survey, just like it sounds, of how we use our time. It found more than a third of Americans did some or all of their work from home last year. But there's work from home, and then there's your work is your home, which leads me to this latest installment of our series, Adventures in Housing. My name is Brig Melissa. I'm a fire lookout for the U.S. Forest Service in Central Oregon. 
A fire lookout is responsible for detecting fires when they're small. And so my job basically is to sit in the fire tower and look over the landscape. So a key component to this job is that housing is provided at no cost. I live in a fire lookout during the fire season, which is a, a 14 foot by 14 foot cabin. Every wall is covered in windows. And then there's a, a bed, a desk, um, a stove, a little dorm sized fridge. It's the closest you can get to living outside uh, without living outside. Uh, what I do the rest of the year when I'm not a fire lookout varies. The pay for a fire lookout is approximately $18 an hour. And I have been able to live off of that for the entire year. Um, maybe picking up a cash job here and there. However, the last winter and this winter, I will be helping care for my elderly mother. So I'll take a couple trips, but I'll mostly help care for her. When someone asks where I live, I, I say I do not have a home base. For me personally, housing is anywhere that I feel safe and cozy. That can be the inside of my minivan. It can be the inside of the fire lookout for four months. The money part of housing is probably uh, uh, the, the biggest component. If I commit to a mortgage or honestly even paying rent on a place and a lease, then it just feels terrifying that what if suddenly I didn't have the money to pay for that and where now I can get by on very little money. It's not comfortable um, living the way I live sometimes, but it's comfortable to me. I'm 53 years old and up until recently, to tell you the truth, I really didn't think about the long term. I thought, yeah, I'll just keep rolling. You know, there's a whole world out there for seasonal work and and nomadic lifestyles. I, I envision that I would do the seasonal work as long as I physically can. And I know some fire lookouts um, in their 80s. So I sure hope that this job still exists when I'm 80 and I'd, I'd love to be one of those people. Brig Melissa, living in a fire lookout tower in central Oregon. Whether you live in a 14 by 14 cabin or any other kind of structure, we want to hear about your adventure in housing. You can tell us about it at marketplace.org. There was some research out from the good people at Pew the other day that is relevant to this next story. Tattoos are more popular than ever in this country. 32% of Americans have at least one tattoo. 22% have more than one. And Pew does point out that public attitudes toward body ink are becoming more accepting. Sometimes, though, a tattoo can be a bit inconvenient. And therein lies a business opportunity. Ray Ellen Bichelle from KFF Health News has the story. A few months ago, University of Colorado nanoengineer Carson Bruns pulled his colleagues into his lab and asked them to help test his latest invention. We were like, okay, we're gonna tattoo ourselves. Can you help us <laughs> today? The invention is a special disappearing tattoo ink. You know how a mood ring changes color with temperature? His tattoo changes with light. UV light to turn it on, regular light to make it vanish. Bruns's tattoo is a dot on his forearm. That little blue spot there, like that. Now it's gone. The ink's made of nanoparticles of dye encased in beads of plexiglass, the same material used in dermal fillers, which some people use to plump their cheeks. For now, these disappearing tattoos are basically a party trick. So you can go to court and turn it off, and then go to the party and turn it on, and then go to grandma's house and turn it off. Bren started a company with a guy named Keith McCurdy, who's pretty famous in the tattoo world. Started with Rihanna. 
He first made a name for himself after tattooing a Sanskrit verse on Rihanna's hip and thigh. McCurdy is also known as Bang Bang, just like his tattoo parlors. And turns out he loves the idea of tattoos that have a purpose beyond art. He and Bruns are calling their product Magic Ink. The skin is almost this minimally invasive interface for technology. And he sees this as a first step toward all kinds of health tech that lives in the skin and senses something that's going on with the body. Want to know if your blood alcohol level is too high to drive or maybe if it's time for insulin or to reapply sunscreen? Ideal world, there'd be tattoos for all that, according to McCurdy. It's almost this this kind of first step to taking humans into the future. But that future ain't cheap. A tattoo of, say, your cat's face on your back... The magic ink for that could run more than $1,000. Traditional ink would be more like 70 bucks. For now, these disappearing tattoos are only available to a select few as McCurdy and Bruns finalize the formula. John Swerk will be paying attention if slash when that ink does hit tattoo parlors. He's a chemist at Binghamton University in New York, and he says tattoos are loosely regulated. In terms of, you know, long-term studies around safety, there's a lot of things that need to happen. So a new ink comes with unknowns. If somebody's going to get tattooed with magic ink, they have to accept a degree of uncertainty about what the future is going to hold with that ink. Tattoo artist Selena Medina in Charlotte, North Carolina, is wary too. Wow. Okay. Rewritable tattoo ink. But what does that actually mean? Medina designs colorful, hyper-realistic tattoos. Think an arm covered in a coral reef teeming with crabs and tentacles. She's big on promoting safety, including as a board member with the Alliance of Professional Tattooists. She'd like to know Magic Ink is safe before loading her tattoo pen with it. I'd probably give it a year in the market before I would buy it, but it does look really interesting. And she expects there will be demand for tattoos that turn on and off. I can imagine that my customers are going to be, what the hell is this magic ink? I need it. After all, her customers are the type willing to get a permanent portrait of like Edward Scissorhands on their thighs. Not exactly nervous Nellies. In Colorado, I'm Rail and Bichelle for Marketplace. You know who else are nervous Nellies? David Brancaccio and the fearless crew on the Marketplace Morning Report. Getting up out of bed every day, early, early, early. To set you up for your business day. Check them out. This final note on the way out today, I don't even really know what to do with this one, but in keeping with the mission of this program to raise the economic intelligence of this country... I offer it for your general knowledge. A story from the Wall Street Journal the other day about the biggest seller of sushi in this economy. I'm going to give you as many guesses as you need to come up with an answer. I am pretty sure you are not going to get it. Kroger, the supermarket chain, 40 million pieces of sushi sold in a typical year. Marketplace is supported by Ravello, a platform for growth-focused companies to hire pre-screened, top-tier remote software developers in U.S. time zones quickly and effortlessly. R-E-V-E-L-O dot com. And by Fortra, a software company dedicated to building a stronger, simpler future for cybersecurity and IT teams around the world. Learn more at F-O-R-T-R-A dot com. All right, we're going to go. Here, though, is your moment of economic context. It is today a quick vocabulary lesson. Reservation wage. The pay somebody would take to take a new job. It's in the news today thanks to a new survey from the New York Fed, which shows the average reservation wage in this economy keeps going up. $78,645 last month. That is up from almost $73,000 a year ago. That is across the whole economy, by the way. College graduates are looking for six figures. All right, we're going. Daily production team, you know them. Livy Burdett, Andy Corbin, Richard Cunningham, Maria Hollenhorst, Sarah Leeson, Sean McHenry, and Sophia Terenzio. I'm Kai Rizdal. We will see you tomorrow, everybody. This is APM. WNYC supporters include the John S. and James...